Thank you. Thank you. So this evening we've been spending a lot of our time thinking and talking about movement. But I'd like to take some time to talk about what is it that stops us from moving, either physically or psychologically? What are the forces that are at play that stop objects from moving where they're supposed to go? And stop people from achieving the dreams and the desires that they want to achieve? Now one of these forces is friction. We're all familiar with the frictional forces. We understand the concept of low friction. For example, if you put on an ice skate and you go out onto an ice rink and you start skating around. The, the combination of the ice and the steel has a low coefficient of friction, which means that movement is very easy. It doesn't require a lot of effort. On the other hand, if you put on a pair of bunny rabbit slippers and you try to wade through a river of honey, you might find that there's a higher coefficient of friction. And as such, the effort required to get to where you want to go is a bit greater. Now, what I like about using friction as an example is that we can apply some of the thinking from the physical forces of friction over into the psychological forces that are at play. And as such, I've kind of named this talk this evening the coefficient of personal friction. What is it inside each of us that stops us from moving as freely as we want to move? So in order to understand how this relates to us from a psychological perspective, we need to understand the frictional story. So this frictional story began back in the day of Leonardo, and inside his encoded notebooks, he had information about frictional forces. But it was the work that came after Leonardo of guys like Coulomb and Euler that really gave us a good understanding of what friction is and how it applies to our physical world. Now what did they give us? They essentially gave us a model that looks something like this. You may have seen this when you were going to high school in physics class or in uni. And this is a model that describes the interaction between different forces when you try to move things about. If we try to push a block in this direction, we're going to experience an opposing force in the opposite direction. This force is known as the frictional force. And this frictional force is made up of the coefficient of friction, which is determined by the two surfaces at play. Low, co low coefficient of friction, ice on steel, easy movement, high co coefficient of friction, bunny rabbit slippers on honey, movement a lot more difficult. But how does this apply to us as humans? Well, I describe the materials at play and that are opposing each other to create our coefficient of friction. It's not to do with who we are as physical objects. It's to do with the intentions and the motivations that we have. Are your intentions aligned with those around you? Are your motivations aligned with the people around you? Or are their motivations creating friction on you? That's one aspect of how the frictional model can be used to apply to understand human behavior. Now, another concept that these guys gave us was the concept that static friction is greater than kinetic friction. And what I mean by that is we all know the experience when you're trying to move a fridge across the floor. The initial push that it takes to get it moving is greater than the push that you need to keep it moving. The same with any idea. If you have an idea and you want to do something, the effort required to get you moving at the start and overcome that initial inertia is greater than the effort required to keep you moving once the idea is in flow. So that's another one of these kind of frictional model ideas that can be applied to us. But let's have an example of it working in real life. What's the first movement that we take on ourselves every day? Getting out of bed. So here we have a guy having sweet dreams, and it's getting to that inevitable time of the day when he's going to have to have a motivating force that says, get out of bed. Now, this motivating force will be large or small, depending on numerous factors inside this guy. How much sleep did he get last night? Does he actually want to get up? Does he have something you know, worth doing? Is he having a good dream? And we saw that in our model, for every, every force that is trying to bring us in one direction, there's opposing forces that are going to try and move against us. Now, in this example, our motivating force is our sleeper's intention. Let's call him, for example, Pat. He's asleep in bed. Now, there's opposing forces. Now, those opposing forces are the intentions of those around him. So you might say, well, how could the intentions of someone else influence this guy. <laughs> Take a look at her eyes. 
the intention that she has inside her head, I'm pretty sure it's going to make getting out of bed this morning a lot more difficult. <laughs> now, as well as the intentions of other people around us, we have this, the slope of the model. And I liken the slope to the physical uh, circumstances that we find ourselves in. So on this morning, depending on whether it's hot or cold outside, if it's colder, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to get out of bed. If it's warmer, it's going to be easier. If we replace that woman's intentions with something else, if she's angry and she wants to berate this man, it makes it easier to get out of bed. <laughs> Change this woman into a wet dog. <laughs> and getting out of bed requires no effort at all. So we can begin to see that there's a variety of forces at play that decide whether or not doing something, taking action, is easy. So we've seen that these forces are compromised of the general circumstances of the situation, the intentions of those around you, and your personal intentions. Now this space between your intentions and the intentions of those around you, I describe that as the place where you have the coefficient of personal friction. Now to give you an understanding of where I'm coming from from all of this, I'm just going to tell a little story about something that happened to me some time ago. <laughs> It was 2005 and I was working in the city of London. I was working really hard. I was living a very, I was living a bad lifestyle. I was working too hard, playing too hard, and eventually everything was going to catch up with me. Well, one day it did. I woke up one morning on the 7th of July, 2005, and I was essentially paralyzed. I was in my bed, I could not move with pain. I started thinking about what's going on here. This was freaking me out. I didn't understand what was happening. And after a couple of hours, I managed to crawl my way out of bed and get into a taxi, which brought me to the hospital. Something happened that morning that deviated me from my normal path of taking public transport in London to work. And anyone who knows what happened in London on that day would know that, you know, nice coincidence. Essentially, that was the day that terrorists uh, attacked London City and lots of people were killed on the public transport. I went to the hospital instead that, that morning. And when I got there, the nurse diagnosed me and she said, oh, yeah, don't worry about it. Take some anti-inflammatories and sent me on my way. The anti-inflammatories allowed me to walk out of the hospital that morning. But fast forwarding on a couple of weeks later, I started to realize the force that was at play was having a very significant effect on my life. Six weeks later, I was back in Dublin and I was still paralyzed, lying on the floor of my apartment. On my own, 23 hours a day, this was back in the day before everyone had broadband internet, so try thinking about how difficult that was. <laughs> Instead, I had to surround myself with things like books and you know, interesting new ways of thinking to try and occupy my mind. But unfortunately, with the, prog with the diagnosis that I'd been given and the prognosis, I was taking medication which was numbing my mind for pain and was also attacking the cells inside my body to try and break down the illness that was inside me. I started to realize that this was not good for me. My mind, wasn't, my mind wasn't sharp, and my body was feeling the effects of these, these, med these different medications. So I had to make a very tough decision, and I made the decision to abandon the medication that the doctors gave me. And you might say, why would you do that? That's crazy. It was crazy. But at the time, I'd been exposed to some fairly radical ideas inside some of these books, and I started to learn the power of intention. And when you put your mind to something, that there is pretty, in my opinion, there is pretty much nothing you cannot achieve. I was paralyzed. I could not move because even the slightest movement caused crippling pain throughout my body. My friction was pain, and I needed to overcome my pain. I was reading books by guys like Eckhart Tolle. Tolle. I was reading things about meditation. I was reading things about sports psychology. From the sports psychology, I learned about a concept known as visualization. Now, for my friction, I needed something to overcome this friction. I needed a lubricator. And the lubricators that I had were visualization and affirmation. Visualization involved me picturing myself as being healthy. I said, picture yourself being healthy. Because where the mind goes, the body will follow. With the same thing with affirmations, I started repeating a mantra inside myself. I started developing new habits. One of the habits I developed was when I got up to go for a run, um, when I was still crippled, my first day running was like this. But inside my head, I was thinking, you're running. 
This is what a healthy person does. Healthy people run. By default, you're going to become healthy. After weeks, I was able to walk. After months, I was able to run. A year later, I was in the best physical condition of my life. I practiced these techniques every day with serious intent because I realized how bad I had it. And I saw where I wanted to go. Now, these things, visualization and affirmations, a lot of people regard them as pseudoscience. And I say, brilliant, you know, you have an opinion on them. However, there is published research out there on visualizations that state even just thinking about exercising can increase the physical strength in your body by up to 30%. Uh, <laughs> even thinking, this is published research, thinking about exercising. The, the numbers vary from between 13 to 30 percent, but there's a proven correlation between visualization and increase in physical capacity. In terms of affirmation, the research is a little bit less conclusive. It's been found for people with positive self-image that affirmations can really help in developing positive, life-changing habits, so to help you start eating healthy or to maintain a healthy fitness regime. However, for people with poor self-image and low self-esteem, it's been found that affirmations are not the tool they need to use. These affirmations actually set them further back in their development and can cause negative effects. So it's all about choosing the right tools and the right lubricators for you. As I said, in my situation, pain was my friction. And to overcome it, I had my lubricators. Everyone has their own friction. So everyone will have their own lubricators. Your lubricators might be things like acceptance, accepting things the way they are. It could be forgiveness, forgiving somebody for something that they did to you before so you can move on with your life. Let go of these things. Compassion. We hear the Dalai Lama talk about this type of stuff. What can compassion do for you? Where can that bring you in your life? So I'm just going to finish up today with a quote from one of our most famous and illuminated scientists. I'll just let you read that for a moment, because Darwin's often misquoted. He never said that it was survival of the fittest, or survival of the strongest, or the survival of the best looking, or the survival of the most intelligent, which we all are, of course. <laughs> he said it's about those most adaptable to change. Now, with humans sitting at, at the top of the food pyramid at the moment, we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to evolve? Are we going to physically evolve like we have done in the past? I'm of the opinion that we won't. I think our evolution is going to come in a different medium. I think we're about to enter the medium of evolution of thought and mind, where ideas are going to bring us to the next level. Now, I had to overcome some resistance to change my ideas about what, what was possible, what is possible, and what can be possible. And I put it to you this evening. I put three questions to you. What's your personal friction? What is it stopping you from doing? And what are your lubricators? <laughs>